All right. Good morning. How's everybody doing? All right. I heard a good. I heard a swell. I like swell. That's a little unique. Um, hey, well, I just want to, uh, again, make my comedic joke uh, that I appreciate y'all being here. Okay, no, you don't appreciate that. No, no, absolutely zero feedback on that one. There was just like, I appreciate y'all being here. And you're like, okay. That's, I'm just letting you know if someone, if you did that to someone in your home, if someone did that to you and you're like, thanks for coming, they're like, yeah. You'd be like, oh, okay. So I'm going to try my hardest. Say it again, just say it again. Well, now, well, you should have laughed then, Christina. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. Uh, hey, uh, again, I, we have, I've made this joke before, but, you know, church plants and three-day weekends are like, they're like arch enemies. You know, they are. They're like arch enemies. Like a three-day weekend comes and you're on the planning, you're on the, the calendar, and you're like, well, just, you know, there's this feeling, I should say, of just like, well, just write that one off. And it's not. You're here, and I thank, I'm thankful that you're here. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I appreciate y'all not joking. All right, uh, before we start here, I do want to put on a timer because uh, I like to talk, and uh, I like to talk more than you like to listen. So <laughs> let me go ahead and put this on so that we can, uh, I can, you know, track with what's going on here. Um, this week, what we're going to do is we're going to be continuing our sermon series in uh, Philemon, where it's just the book of Philemon. That's what we've been talking about. And it's a short book, a one-chapter letter uh, from the Apostle Paul to a man named Philemon, uh, who lived in, more than likely lived, in a city called Colossae, the same city that the book of Colossians, that letter was written to, uh, who was really uh, working through a situation where a runaway slave had uh, run from his house and was uh, taking up uh, refuge in uh, Paul's care. And the letter is sent with this runaway slave known, named Onesimus, in order to go back to Paul and to really radically redefine their relationship through uh, the gospel. And so in a world where all these are realities are just, just assumed, right? There's just there's a, so much that's just assumed on what should happen. Slavery is just completely, you know, talked about in, in an okay way. Uh, this, this situation that Onesimus was probably in with Philemon, maybe the potential for abuse that's taken place there. All of it's seen as kind of just the norm. Uh, this letter offers this tremendous vision of what the gospel does in our relationships. When we actually start to live it out, when we believe it, one, and then that belief starts to, to work its way through all the things that try to stop us from living out what we believe. The, the beautiful just, just revival, revision, renewal that takes place in our hearts and the world around us when this starts to happened is just it's just incredible and, and I'll say I've said it many times before Philemon is one of my favorite books of the Bible I, I think it's like I mean want to say it's like 30 verses or 31 maybe something like that and it's just 30 31 20 whatever <laughs> verses of just power when you start working through it as I mentioned last week we don't have enough time to go into the background of everything that's going on in Philemon uh, and so if, if you want a little bit more backdrop if you have questions about things like slavery that's a topic in here and and some of what's happening here and what the what the Bible really does in in, in terms of working toward that there's a couple of resources available uh, on the devotional page of our website for Philemon if you've read those shout out to you I can see the download number, so I know most of you haven't. No. <laughs> however, <laughs> however uh, they're available to you, and uh, I wrote them in seminary, and they are, uh, they're, they're helpful, I think, at bare minimum. So if you want some more information on that, feel free to do that. But what I want to do this week is I want to kind of move forward and kind of uh, draw some of this to a conclusion regarding what's happening in Philemon. Last week, we really sought out to answer the question, and I think it's a, a very valid question. I think it's a question that's at the heart of of the book of Philemon, of, of Paul's uh, initial introduction of this character in his letter, and that was the, the question, what stops us from living out what we believe? This week, as we draw to the second part of the, the book, I, I really want to answer this question. You can put it back up. What defines your relationships? What defines your relationships? And the reason I want to answer this question is because I think this question is at the heart of Paul's request of Philemon in the second part of the book, and there will be light. And, and, and I think that when we start to look at Paul's request, we start to understand that, that really he's calling into question for Philemon, what defines the relationships around you? What defines the relationships in your life? 
why do I say that? Well, let's, let's take a look at the actual request. So, so last week we saw that, that Paul was introducing Philemon. He was, he was saying, hey, I'm, I'm kind of, he was buttering him up almost. A lot, of, a lot of commentators do make that note that he's praising Philemon and he's introducing a lot of ideas about how close Philemon must be to the Lord and how much of a blessing because he's going to make a pretty radical request of him. And that request comes in verses 15 and 16. Near the, the middle of the book, Paul, uh, kind of uh, in a climactic moment, says, for perhaps this is why he, that is Onesimus, the runaway slave, was separated from you for a brief time so that you might get him back permanently, not no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly beloved brother. He's especially so to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so a lot of Philemon is building up to this moment. Building up to this moment where Paul is going to, through a single single observation and a single request, is going to throw in flux, is going to challenge, is going to call into question how Philemon defines his relationships. How he defines his relationships with Onesimus, but also it's going to call into question how Philemon defines, what defines Philemon's relationship with the culture and the world around him. Uh, talking about this, uh, this specific verse, again, um, Marion May Thompson, uh, an incredible writer and theologian, uh, she said this about this specific line. Paul did not write the letter to send a runaway slave back to his master or out of any convictions regarding the abiding validity of the institution of slavery uh, and the importance of keeping the social structure intact. Rather, he wanted to bring Philemon and Onesimus together on a new footing established by the reconciling work of Christ, a topic to which he, Paul devotes considerable space in other epistles, other letters. So what, what is she saying? She's saying that he's not sending Onesimus back because it's like, well, I guess it's the right thing to do. I mean, like, that's his master. He's sending Onesimus back. Paul has had Onesimus in his care. He's sending Onesimus back to Philemon, really for the purpose of saying, we're going to really put to, put to paper, put to the test, this thing that we talk about all the time. I write letters and say that there's no more female, no male, no slave, no free, no Gentile, no Greek, uh, no, no Hebrew. I say all this stuff, but when, the, when, when, it, when you know, rubber hits the road, all of a sudden, I got a runaway slave coming to, coming to say, hey, can I stay with you because things are rough back home? And Paul is sending Onesimus back, not just to say, hey, well, we got to do the right thing. And, and you know, you're, 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 he's, he owns you. I can't keep you. But rather because he recognizes this is a moment where the gospel comes alive. Where the gospel comes alive. But he does it. He does this, right? Through this request that, that in, a, in, a, in a swift, just like slash of the pen, calls into question, right, Philemon's, Philemon, I told you, y'all going to hear me say this 58 different ways this, this morning, um, his relationship with others and his relationship with culture, and most importantly, what defines them. And he, in essence, in this request is saying, hey, I want you to redefine your relationships and with the most important thing in any relationship being the work of Jesus. The work of Jesus, the reconciling work of Jesus, what he's done in his life, his death, his resurrection. I want this to be the defining factor and characteristic in every single one of your relationships. The ones with other people, the ones with the rest of the world, all of them will be defined. They will be, be, be overly submitted, right, to the work of Jesus, what he says, his ways, his view, his vision of the world. That's what I want you to do. The thing is, I think for a lot of us, that sounds absolutely crazy because that's hard. Let me, let me ask you, who here, is, who here has done that absolutely? All right, I'm thankful there's no, there's no fools or liars uh, at the moment. We may be fools or liars for other things, but at least in this area, we, we're, we're well enough to know, like, nah, I don't think I got that down. Because relationships are so much more than just our feelings to something. There's so much more than just our feelings. Right? When we hear someone say, hey, I want you to... to to bring your relationships and to really submit them to the gospel, define them by the gospel. It sounds like, okay, that sounds reasonable. But once we start to dive into relationships, it becomes overwhelming because you realize exactly how much has to be submitted to the gospel. How much has to be submitted to Jesus to just get one relationship defined that way. Much less all of them. Much less my relationship with a bigger structure like the culture or the world around me. 
Why is that? Uh, again, I think it's because there's so much more to relationships than just my feelings. Let, let's, take a, let's take a short example, right? Let's say a personal relationship, and you can insert your relationship with a person you decide in here. Let's think about a personal relationship. What goes into a personal relationship? Right, if in the center is the personal relationship and surrounding it are all the things that contribute to that relationship, just in a short list where people tell me all the time, don't put too much up there because I can't see it, right? Like, I, and I mean a lot of y'all, y'all are all like, hey, hey, that's a, the text is a little too small, so I can only fit so many things on here. And in those so many things, there's still like six things. And it's just a short list. What contributes to a personal relationship? Well, I want you to think about the fact that your family history definitely contributes to your, to your personal relationships. That's where your personal relationships start. They start with mom and dad, brother, sister. For some of us in here, we have a relationship where we go, oh, I love my mom. I love my dad. They were a great example of God to me. They showed me care. They showed me compassion. They showed me Jesus. For some of us, we have a much more difficult family history. We, we come in with the ideas that maybe dad or mom, and, and whether this is true or not, dad and mom didn't want me. They didn't care. Also, the values we bring into any relationship, they largely come from the family history you bring into it. How we see the world is not just shaped overnight. It's shaped by, by years and years and years and years and years of your family going, this is what's important. This is what's not important. Maybe you grew up in a family, you had a host of different friends. Like y'all had friends over every night and you were like, so-and-so is my uncle. And that person is a completely different color than you, right? Like, it's just like, it's just, man, it's clear family is, friends are like family. Maybe you grew up in a family where there weren't really many friends at all. Y'all spent most of the time together by yourself. And if you did have people over, they had the same name as you, the same culture as you. And so now, when, and when, you, bring pers when you bring this family history in your personal relationships, you don't know how close you should get to a friend. But you know if someone has the same last name as you, you can share everything with them. Or the alternative. Maybe you don't trust your uncles, aunts, cousins that much, but you, you live to form relationships with people that are friends but become family, and you share everything. So you're bringing a family history in, and you're also bringing experiences from outside this relationship, right? This, let's say this is a person. You're bringing experiences from outside, the things that you've had happen in other relationships. This happens in romantic relationships all the time. All right, I'm, not, I'm not trying to – I was going to make a joke. I'm not going to. Uh, you know, like if you've been hurt in another relationship, if you've been stung in something, you bring some of those, those sensibilities, some of those experiences into a new relationship. And all of a sudden, when someone looks at the phone at 1030 and y'all are hanging out, the instant belief and fear in you is, what if it's this, like it was before? Your experiences with other your experiences within that relationship. Maybe, maybe this person is actually giving you absolutely zero reason to mistrust them in any way. Maybe this person is giving you any reason to be angry at them. And so you really are, are conflicted in any relationship because you're looking at it and going, man, I, I, I have all these fears, but the way this person treats me and loves me is incredible. I mean, it's amazing. You have your sinfulness, your own expectations and your own preferences, just things that you expect from a relationship that other people may not expect, and you got to work that out. But at the beginning, you're like, you didn't do this. And they're like, I didn't even know I was supposed to do that. What are you talking about? Um, if you're married, dishes are these things, right? Dishes are one of these things where all of a sudden it's like, we can, we can wash them tomorrow. And then your, your spouse is like, no, we're going to wash them tonight. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, God, I'm, I'm just trying to relax. This person doesn't want me to relax. And all the other person is like, this person doesn't want me to be comfortable. And all of the, it's just certain two people going and saying, my expectations for dishes are different. And so you take your preferences. Your, but then also for Christians, you bring in your gospel experience. You bring in the truth and the realities that God loves you and that he cares for you, that he's present, that he would die for you, that he resurrects and in him we're accepted and loved and cared for. So we're bringing in this experience as well. And all of, of, of our personal relationship, right, this, each one of them is bringing in all these different things and much, much more, and we're trying to figure out what defines this relationship, right? What, what overall defines it? Is, it? is it that my experience with this person has been so hard or has been so good that the defining narrative is that experience with that person? Is it that I can't trust anybody anymore because my experience is outside of this relationship? And so now, because I've been hurt in the past, I don't trust anybody. Maybe it's our preferences. Well, this person doesn't fit my, my idea of what friendship is. They don't talk the way I like. They don't listen to the same music I like. And that means that we can't be friends. Is it our family history, our sinfulness? Is it our gospel experience? Again, Paul would look and say, this one should be it. But in reality, we're wrestling with so much stuff, again, and so much more than just what's on this 
admittedly small screen. But then we, we, let's take another example, right? Instead of personal, let's do our relationship with culture, our relationship with the world around us. What is that? Well, we have a lot of the same stuff. We're bringing in our family history, the way we've been shaped to see things, the values we've been brought up to see. But then we also have, again, our sinfulness, our preferences. What, what's your political preference? What is your, uh, you know, socioeconomic, the, the culture that you were brought up in probably produced some preferences, that produced some expectations. And you're bringing that into the world and going, well, I think that the government should be run like this. And someone is like, well, I think the government should be run like this. And all of a sudden you're like, I hate that person, right? It happens a lot. It happens an absurd amount. We have our gospel experience, but we also have our experiences inside and outside of the group that we belong in. To, right? Maybe you grew up, um, and, and let me say, I think that this is so on the forefront of what our culture is going through right now, it's crazy. Because your experiences outside of your group largely can define a lot of how you perceive that group, the other groups, I should say, or, or the group you're a part of, I, I mean. Right? Let, let's say that, that you go out of your group, your, your, your cultural group, and you say, hey, when I went outside of my cultural group, other people treated me so well. They love me. And then if you look back and you contrast it and you feel like your experiences inside of your group were not that. Maybe, maybe you grew up in a, you know, I, I, and I'm only going to bring this up because I hear this more than I, I ever thought I would. Uh, coming from where I come from, I was not expecting to hear as much about the white evangelical experience as I, as I do. Because I'm not white and I don't really grew up that evangelical. But it's almost all I hear about now on a regular and frequent basis. That there are people that have been inside of this group and they say, man, in, in here, I felt so much pressure. I felt so much anxiety. I felt so much judgment. I felt so much guilt. I felt all these things so regularly. But then when they, when they contrasted that with the experiences they had outside of their group and they said, man, I met non-Christians that were nicer than the Christians. I met non-Christians that were more accepting than the Christians. All of a sudden, the group that they belonged to became a group that they wanted to disavow. They wanted to disown. I'm not a part of that group anymore. I want to leave that. I want to get as far away from it as possible. And there are groups you can do that with. You just simply check a different box. A lot of us know that experience when it comes to things like families. It's a lot harder. When your family history is like that, like I mentioned before, and you go outside of your group and you go, man, the next door neighbor, the teacher at school, the coach that coached my soccer team, right? The, the nurse at the hospital was so much nicer, was much more a mom to me than my mom was. And all of a sudden you have these instances where people are like, I don't want to be a part of this family anymore. And there's like a disconnect. They don't talk to their mom, to their dad, to their brothers, to their sisters. Right? This is all of what we bring into our relationships. And it's heavy. It's a lot to work through. It's a lot to even learn. Again, this is, this is pretty simplified, if I'm being honest. I think it's much more complex than this. But I want to just give us a, a small example of what I could to kind of show us this is what actually happens when we're thinking about our relationships with other people and our relationships with the world around us. And here, Paul is doing this incredible thing. He's saying, hey, all these experiences... All the experiences that you have, whether they're with another person, whether they're with yourself, whether they're with a cultural group, whether they're the group you belong to, a group that you don't belong to, whether it's your family, whether it's the own wrestling match you have with the sinfulness that's inside of you, whether it's your preferences and your expectations that you feel like are getting met or you feel like are not getting met, all that I want you to do, Philemon, what I want you to do as you bring back Onesimus to you is I want you to place this one over everything. It looks more, if you were going to use it visually, I think it looks a little bit more like, like this. There's the next slide on here, Jackie. More like that, right? Where, where the experience of, of God's love, his affection, his care, his compassion, his vision for the world, his vision of forgiveness starts to take the primary place by which we define the primary lens through which we approach, the primary experience from which we experience relationships starts to be defined by our gospel experience with Jesus over all these other things. Now, I want to stop real quick because I know that this is a little bit, there's a couple of tricky landmines to go through here. 
A lot of us right now are looking at something like this and we're going, well, man, I really don't appreciate this. Primarily because it feels like what you're telling me is to cast off all of the experiences that I've had, put away all of the injustices that I felt, put away all of the pain that I feel, and all of the anger that I have. And from there to, to just put the gospel, this, this idea of Jesus' compassion and his love and his sacrifice and his forgiveness above everything. And I just have to stuff all that. I just have to stuff it. It feels unfair. Friend, I'm going to be honest, it feels unjust. That's what some of you are, are probably feeling at this moment. And I want to lovingly, I'm going to try to navigate this carefully. I want to lovingly tell you, I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's what Paul's saying. I don't think that's what I'm trying to say. I don't think. The Bible takes justice extremely seriously. Extremely. Go to Exodus and read the laws of restitution to see how how particular God is about making things right, about making justice happen, about seeing what was what was not done right being restored to what is done right. The issue with our feelings versus the God of the Bible and the scriptures itself is that oftentimes we take our bitterness and we confuse them with justice and we think they're the same thing. And they're not. The thing is we often take our, our experiences of anger and we confuse them with justice and we think they're the same thing and they're not. We take our feelings and desires for vengeance that someone would feel as bad as I feel. That must be justice. And we think they're the same thing and they're not. Friend, the the gospel invites us to try as much as we're capable and ultimately finding the fulfillment of this effort in Jesus to make things right. Again, things, things can't be left unright. To make things right. To see and say, hey, if someone has done something wrong to someone, let's try and make sure that justice reigns and that that is made right. That they're, 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 uh, they're brought back to as close to whole, or at least as close as they were before uh, to wholeness, as we can in response to the unjust thing that's happened. Right? To try and, and bring people as close to that type of healing and that type of fullness and that type of peace peace as possible while allowing ourselves to experience the freedom to say, but I don't need that person's remorse to define my relationship with God, with others, with the world around me, because ultimately my life is defined, my relationships are defined, my relationships with others, my relationship with myself, my relationship with the world is defined and worked through this lens that tells me you're loved, you're forgiven, you're whole, whatever you lack, I'll provide. Whatever you need, I'm here to give. This lens is the one that empowers us to be able to look at someone and say, hey, I forgive you. I forgive you even though I can't forget you. I forgive you even though I can't forget you. Because I forgive you. My heart is, my heart is gonna be unburdened of the way you've hurt me, of the way they've hurt me, of the way the world around me has hurt me. I'm not gonna be a fool. I'm called to be wise. And I know you may not be the right person, the right thing, the right group to trust my heart and life to. But I'm not going to let myself be burdened by your dislike of me, by your injustice or action toward me, because there's something much better that I can define my life by. The work, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. That's what Paul's inviting Philemon into, right? Like, define this relationship. I know that you're mad at Onesimus. I know you're mad. I know you thought you were probably being fine. Then you woke up one morning and you were like, where's Onesimus at? And all of a sudden, he's showing back up with a letter from from me, from Paul. I know you're mad at him. I know the culture and society around you is looking at you and going, hey, that calls for some justice. That calls for, (laughs) my joke is that calls for some Old Testament justice right there. That then you need to be forceful. They lived in a world and in a society where when people, when people disagreed with the government and said, you should treat us better, the response from the Roman government was, we're going to kill you. That was the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. If you had anything negative to say about us, if you had any, any uprising, any feelings to try and revolutionize, I wasn't going to have a dialogue with you. I was going to shut that mouth up. That's what every Roman government did for centuries at this point. And I'm sure the same expectation was placed on Onesimus. Hey, 
You want to shut that up? Make sure they know never run again. And yet Paul comes here and says, hey, that's all of that around you is not how I want you to define your experience with Onesimus right now. I want you to define it through the fact that I've loved you, I've forgiven you. And while you were enslaved to something worse, I paid the debt to free you so that you could follow and know Jesus. That experience, the gospel at work in your life is how I want you to approach this man. And yeah, you may have all these things in your ears that say, oh man, like that's not cool, Onesimus is foul. He's trying to like, maybe he's trying to badmouth you. Maybe he told Paul all your business. Maybe you feel like all your stuff is out there. Maybe it feels like everyone around you is like, man, you should beat that boy until he doesn't know which way is left and which way is right so that he never runs again. And all of a sudden, Paul's going, no, 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 that's not, that's not okay either. Because the way you relate to the world around you, I want you to submit it to the ways of love and compassion and forgiveness that, that I bring in order to work through them, right? This, this is what's happening here. And we can, it seems like four verses from 12 to 16 that are pretty chill, pretty, pretty compact, pretty straightforward. But when you put yourself in Philemon's shoes, it's a challenge. It's hard. It asks you to redefine and to revision everything that you know in order to submit it to this new way that Jesus offers and invites us into. But let me, let me tell you something. I think that what's encouraging about this is that, and I don't have enough time to go into this in detail, but I want to mention it shortly, is that this wasn't a request that Paul was making so j that he wouldn't do himself. Paul wasn't asking Philemon to, to do anything that he hadn't done. In fact, the verses that we read today, going back to verses 8 and 9, actually show a progression in Paul's thoughts that are pretty powerful. It's going to be the next slide, Jackie. Right, as, as you, you've heard Paul say, follow me as I follow Christ. And he, he does exactly that in this. And in verse 9 and 10, we see a change in Paul's language when it comes to Onesimus. While Onesimus would have commonly been known as a slave, they would have used his name. They would have, they would have just called him a slave or called him his name. Paul all of a sudden starts using a lot of different language for this man. He says, I've become his father and he's become my son. A Roman citizen. If you read a bit of the background about Paul that I, I, that's available to you in some of those introductions, a man that was more than likely off, pretty well off in Paul. His nephew literally just decided one day, I'm going to talk to the Jerusalem council because Paul's family was probably in like that. A man that was well off and, and, and viewed highly in his culture to look at a slave and say, that's my son. <laughs> what a powerfully beautiful redefinition of a relationship between a slave and a free man. No longer are you a runaway slave and I'm your refuge, but through what we've done in talking about this Jesus, based on what you've done in accepting him, you're following him. We believe the spirit is at work in a way that's powerful and goes beyond what I can see with my eyes, goes beyond what the culture around me can tell me about my relationships, goes above and beyond what even my feelings may communicate to me. And they tell me that now because of what I've done in following Jesus and because of what Jesus has done in me and in others, no longer am I a stranger, no longer am I a foreigner, no longer am I a slave, and he a master, and me a master, and he a slave. But now I'm a brother, I'm a sister, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mother, I'm a father. And Paul starts to use this language that would have definitely rattled someone like Philemon when looking at his slave. And now the very person that just in verse 6, I think a minute ago, said, I actually, you owe me your spiritual life. In other words, I'm your spiritual dad. Now the runaway slave being sent back to him is also, also the son of Paul. The runaway slave left a slave, but in the eyes of the king, the redeemer, the savior, came back a brother, whether Philemon was going to acknowledge it or not. Not just spiritually, but literally, literally. Paul was saying, that's my son. You're my spiritual son. I'm your spiritual father. I discipled. I brought you to faith. Y'all are actually brothers, beloved brothers. So Paul changes his relationship with, with the slave Onesimus, and then he lays down his preferences. In verses 13 to 14, he says, I, I want you, I wanted to just keep Onesimus, to be honest. I'm locked up right now, and to be honest, Onesimus would have been extraordinarily helpful to me. He would have been super helpful. He already was serving, and, and, and I was like, man, my preference was to keep him. And then he says, but 
but I don't want to do anything to violate you. So I'm sending him back. I'm sending him back in hopes that y'all can be restored in a way that completely redefines how you live right now. So Paul lays down, he, de- he changes his, how he perceives and understands relationships. He lays down his preferences in the way he would want to treat Onesimus. And then he comes back uh, to Philemon and says, now I want you to do the same thing. I want you to do the same thing. All right. That section, I feel, took a little longer than I wanted it to. However, I hope you you get what's going on here. The gospel is redefining things spiritually, whether we can see them or not. And Paul is looking at Philemon, and I think the Spirit looks at us to say, I want you to do the same. I want you to define your relationships in a new way. And I want the governing authority in how you see the world around you and how you see the brother or sister next to you to be the life, death, and resurrection of my son more than it's anything else. So as I say most weeks, that's the end of the sermon. That's it. Go out there, just do the hard work of redefining your relationships, and that'll be it. And you come back next week extremely angry at me and discouraged at God. Or maybe discouraged at me and angry with God. Maybe angry at both of us and discouraged with no one. However, I don't think I don't think that is the end. Because let me this is a process that I think has been going on for hundreds of years. A hundred thousands of years before Jesus' time and thousands of years before Paul's time. It was an invitation to treat people well, to be an example of what following God looked like all through the Old Testament. the, the theme of the people of Israel in the, in the Bible was literally supposed to be that they were actually supposed to be the nation of priests. They were supposed to be the people that showed the world around them the kind of grace and love that God showed them so they could be a testimony of God's character all around them. And yet over and over and over again, they fail. They probably feel a lot like you and a lot like me. So what makes the Christian and the Israelite from thousands of years ago different? If the same request is being made, the same challenge is in front of us, what makes it different? Uh, I think Luke 22 makes it different. I think Luke 22 makes it different. Why? Because Luke 22 is beautiful vision and the saddening scene of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Looking at the path that's in front of him and saying, they're going to hate me. The world is not going to love me. The ones who just waved palms to say the king has arrived, in a few hours will be the same crying for murder and asking for me to be killed. The ones I've spent three years with and poured into in a few hours are gonna leave me. One that I spent maybe the most time with is gonna curse me. The life that I created and the life that I live, I'm now going to give up. And if there's any way if there's any way that you can take this from me, please do. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours in other ways. Nevertheless, my experience with you, the loving, compassionate, just heavenly father, will be the one I entrust myself to, even in the midst of all the dark, broken anguish that's around me. And he gets up, and he's arrested, and Peter chops some guy's ears off, and he heals that guy. He heals the, he heals the guy that was coming to arrest him, that, that Peter tried to defend Jesus and, and hurt him. He heals him. 
He's kissed by Judas, another man he spent a long time with, but now is going to betray him. He probably is able to hear Peter not just deny him, but the Bible says to curse him so that he could distance himself from Jesus. Again, the very people that he was surrounded by, and I'm sure in the moment while he was on the donkey's back and everyone was raining down palms saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, he now probably could recognize some of those same faces saying crucify him. All in the matter of a few short hours between these words and what was going to happen. And the thing is, friend, I don't think Jesus is a good example I don't think Jesus is a good example. I think he's a great example. Let me rephrase that a little bit. But I don't think he's just a good example. I think Jesus is the best example while being the perfect substitute for you and for me. Because while he entrusted himself wholly, That the Father would resurrect and redeem and restore all of the darkness that he was wading through. When he defined and lived his life according to what he knew of the Father in heaven, he was taken to the cross like a betrayer. He was taken to the cross like a, like a doubter, like a blasphemer. They literally said, what's, what's, his, what's his cause for, for crucifixion? And they said, he's a blasphemer. He doesn't know our God. He claims to be our God. And they sent the very God they claimed to defend to a cross, not knowing that it was him that had authority to forgive and redeem and restore. That's the type of trust that Jesus puts into his life, puts into the Father, and lives his life through. Also, that when we absolutely fail to do this, when we, are, when we completely lose faith and hope in all things and our lives are not defined by any gospel experience, but they're all of the things that we've gone through, all the experiences we've had. The invitation is not to have to turn around and go, man, I suck. The invitation is to look and go, but he did it. He did it. He didn't stay dead. His resurrection now shows that he's overcome the distrust of our heart. He's, over, he's overcome the lack of faith when we say, no, I don't want to entrust my life to you. I don't want to entrust my faith to you. I don't want to choose you over my pain. I don't want to choose you over my, my, the injustice of my life. I want to hold to these things. I want to define my life by these things. I want to be hurt. I want to be pained. I want that. I want it. And he resurrects and says, no, but I've overcome it. My invitation is not to erase everything you've ever gone through. My invitation is to find find love and care that brings healing and wholeness in me. Not to forget it, but every moment, not to look back and go, I missed, I missed the mark, but rather to continuously come back and go, man, I found myself in him again. I found myself in him again. And because he's resurrected, he keeps sending me out. It's not like I come back and he's like, we got to do a whole class again. Oh, man, we got to go through a discipleship group again. We got to figure out how to do this stuff again. No, he comes he dies, he resurrects, and the theme of our lives after that is he's overcome. The theme of our lives over, after that is he's overcome. In every moment of failure, in every moment of doubt, in every moment of pain, in every moment of sorrow, he's overcome. Again, you don't forget, I don't want to keep, I don't want to make that into a thing that you feel. That idea has hurt a lot of people. And, and, and perpetuated injustice in ways that I think is extraordinarily unhealthy, extraordinarily hurtful, quite frankly, could, could be verging on evil. I don't want to say, hey, that means that you look at an abuser and you go, well, keep abusing. No, 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 no. You, you, you look at what's right and you pursue what's right while no longer needing to be defined by an abuser. Why? Because the man, the myth, the legend, the, right, Jesus Christ himself, not just the, the best example, but the perfect substitute. That's what we live in now. That's who we live in now. Not even me, not even myself, not even the way I feel about me, not the way I see me, not the way I judge me, but that life, that moment when he says, all the darkness is coming, but not my will, your will. I'll trust myself in your hands so that we could trust our life in his hands. That's the gospel, friends. That's what's happening here. 
And that's what I think Philemon is, is being called to, to look at, and to wrestle with. The question here is not, are you doing this? The question is not, are you putting the gospel first and letting everything else be defined by it? The question is, are you, are you finding yourself in Luke 22? Are you finding yourself in Jesus crying out things like, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Are you, are you finding yourself in, in this man's life and in what he's done and in how he sacrificed and in his new life? Are you finding yourself in that? Because that will be the only means by which anything else begins to submit to the gospel. When you find yourself in him, when you find yourself in those things, any other place, any other thing you find yourself in, any other thing that defines your relationships, your relationship with others, your relationship to culture, your relationship with yourself, putting the gospel first and putting everything on the bottom will sound absolutely crazy. It will sound nuts. When we find ourselves in him, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem crazy. Man, it seems preferable. It's like, God, I want that. I want that. I want to do that. The question is, can we find ourselves in this Jesus, in his moments of perfection, in his sacrifice, in his resurrection? That's the daily fight. A couple of practical examples and how to, uh, or suggestions. We're going to apply that and try to figure out how to do it together. Um, I think a couple of things that I would want to encourage you to do. One is, is I would want to encourage you to learn yourself. Friends, a lot of us don't know what, what needs to be fed through the lens of the gospel because a lot of us don't know what is it feeding into anything that's going on in our lives. We have very little understanding of what's impacted us, what's shaped us, what makes us angry. We fly off the handle because it's like, man, that, that, some, that did something inside me. That triggered me. That's like the word, right? Like, that triggered me. We have no idea why it triggered me. We just know I'm triggered, and we think that the trigger must be the right thing. That the trigger is evidence that the, that the, the, the feeling was right, that, that, that I'm right in being angry, not knowing that maybe an ocean of stuff in your life that's contributing to that, that's, that's pushing you to feel that way, that causes that trigger. You have to learn you. And maybe that's through counseling. Maybe that's through, like, discipleship. Maybe that's through, like, like your own time, meditating, looking back on your own heart, your own life. And sim I have a couple of, of tools. They're not, again, I don't think that this replaces something. I'm never going to be the guy that's like, oh, what the church gives you can replace something like the, the, the common grace of counseling or therapy. I'm not that guy. Uh, that the, the Lord works in, in a therapy session as much as he does at an altar call. Let me tell you that. But... Uh, I have a couple of things out in seminary that, that can help maybe identify high and low points in your life that may have contributed to the way you see yourself. So stuff like that is helpful, but learning us, learning ourselves is so huge. And then from there, learn Christ. Learn Christ, friend. Learn him as he looks at the face of darkness and says, I, I, your will be done, not mine. And then lovingly forgives people, lovingly cares for people, builds people up looks at a woman who's thrown in front of him because she's in adultery, and he's like, who condemns you? I don't need, like, just learn him. Just learn him. See him. Be with him. Pray with him. To him. Read about him. Share time with people who show you him. Just, just learn him. Learn him, because having a vision of him, a vision of him will answer so many of the questions that are hard. And not all of them, I can't guarantee that, but man, learn him. And from there, uh, work out the difference in community. Learn you, learn him, work out the difference with godly community. If you want to work out the difference on your own, I promise you, I promise you. I don't care what the, the, the guy that's going through deconstruction right now tells you. 
I don't care what, and I'm not even fully hating on that. Like I said, I think there's some godly characteristics to, to eagerly desiring to know who God is and, and removing the things that prevent us from knowing that. But I don't care what that person says, what philosophy says, what your university class says. I don't care what, you know, your, your mom says, your dad says, your, your friend at work says. Working out the difference between who God is, who Jesus is, and who I am by myself inevitably leaves me burdened and angry. It leaves me angry that I can't figure it out. It leaves me angry that I failed again. It leaves me forgetting that he's gracious and loving. It leaves me completely by myself with my own failures looking at me in my face. And very, very rarely do I successfully apply the gospel to myself the way my boy, my homegirl, my wife, my family, my community, the way they will. Very rarely. The human condition is not one that says, hey, I'm completely fine all the time. The human condition is one that sees the depths of what we're going through and tends to respond by making up all kinds of stuff. And so don't learn you, learn Christ, work out the difference in community, friend. If you don't work out the difference in community, I'm telling you, it's going to be hard. So what defines our relationships? Our experience in the gospel, our other experiences, our family history, or whatever you, you put in there. No, he defines it and what you know of your relationship with him, with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the truth of what you've done on the cross. Thank you for the truth of what you've done in our lives. Thank you that you are not just a good example. You are not a great example. You are the best example, but you're likewise the perfect substitute. You believe when our faith is, is nowhere to be seen. You trust when our heart is filled with doubt. You care when our heart is filled with bitterness. You love when we are just loveless. You fill in every place for us so that in you we would be found in the midst of our faithless, in the midst of our lack of love, in the midst of our doubt, in the midst of every single failure. We find them reconciled in the perfect example and the perfect substitute, the perfect life of Jesus. And in your resurrection, we're now invited to pursue life as you call us to without the fear of failure, without the fear of being defined by our doubts, by our shortcomings, by our this, by our that, but now defined by you. You are my def definition. You are our definition. Help us to seek you. Help us to know you. Help us to cling to you. Help us to abide in you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.